Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on uh, Chapter 1 of the third edition of the Zell Python programming book. Uh, chapter 1 is an introductory chapter. It's about uh, computers and programs. Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So uh, we have some objectives uh, here for the chapter. I'll leave those for you to read. I typically uh, post the slides um, in my courses so that uh, you can download the slides and read through the objectives uh, yourself. Um, so uh, computers are pretty special machines and uh, they're, uh, they're very common in our everyday life these days. So uh, it's the rare person who comes to this uh, course who doesn't have some idea what a computer can do. But uh, let's see, the definition that we begin with is uh, a modern computer can be defined as the machine that stores and manipulates information or under the control of a changeable program. Okay. Um, and uh, it's changeable in the sense of at any one time uh, we put uh, one program or other in control of the computer. Um, it typically the kinds of programs that we're interested in are called applications or application uh, programs. Um, and as we change from application to application or program to program, we're expecting the computer to work in uh, sometimes completely different ways uh, because it's a very general machine uh, and it can accommodate a lot of different kinds of applications. So two key elements here, uh, computers are devices for manipulating information and uh, two, that they operate under the control of a changeable program. Okay, so uh, these uh, general purpose stored program computers are uh, kind of the kind of computer of the day. Uh, and if you have a laptop or a desktop or even uh, a uh, smartphone, uh, you certainly have experience with uh, one of these uh, computers. Uh, so what's the computer program then? Well, it's a detailed step-by-step -step set of instructions telling a computer what to do. If we change the program, the computer performs a different set of actions or a different task. The machine stays the same, but the program uh, changes. And again, from what I said, uh, just a little while ago, um, I don't think that most people are surprised uh, by that. Um, what we uh, commonly think of applications or uh, apps are uh, programs. And uh, we're pretty used to uh, having a, a computer that runs many apps. And so we're uh, pretty used to somehow uh, signaling the computer we want to run uh, a, a different app and having that load up and run and, and then uh, when we're sick of that we uh, stop that and we start some other app. So the computer uh, remains the same but the programs it's running at any uh, particular time uh, change uh, depending upon what we're trying to accomplish. Programs are said to be executed or carried out. All computers have the same uh, power with suitable programming. For instance, each uh, computer can do the things that any other computer can do. Uh, now this is a, a bit of an oversimplification, but the fact is that uh, uh, the point that the author is uh, trying to make here is that um, these, uh, again, general purpose stored program uh, computers, um, it's the same kind of computer um, 
that runs our uh, our laptops, our desktops, uh, our uh, our DVR uh, on which we record our uh, our TV programs, our uh, our smartphones uh, to a certain extent, our digital watches, our GPSs. Uh, pretty much these are all based upon the same class of computer. Now, are some more capable than others? Uh, yes. Are some faster than others? Yes. Um, but they do essentially the same thing. So, uh, uh, software or programs rule the hardware the uh, physical uh, machine. So uh, the hardware is uh, pretty uh, docile and it uh, when it's uh, behaving the right way it uh, kind of sits around uh, and waits to be uh, commanded by a program and uh, uh, programs are uh, software. Uh, the process of creating uh, programs is called programming or sometimes coding. So why would you want to learn to program? Well, you want to learn to program because you're part of the course that I'm teaching and uh, the objective is to learn to program. But that kind of begs the question. Um, programming is a fundamental part of computer science and uh, in the courses where I'm teaching, we're learning information science, which is, it can be distinguished from the computer science. Um, and we do that, I think, in our introductory uh, course uh, pretty well. But um, so it's uh, uh, whichever uh, discipline we're following, um, uh, computer programming is a big part of what uh, practitioners in our field uh, do. So that's why we would want to learn it. We want to be a, a full uh, practitioner. Um, even if we don't want to be a practitioner ourselves, even if we wanted to say supervise uh, uh, computer programming uh, practitioners or just uh, um, have people buy, uh, have people build computer programs for our use or for the use of people who work under our, our uh, supervision. Um, then uh, it's going to help us to understand what they can do and how they can do it, right? So even though we might not be expecting to be being a programmer on an everyday basis in our uh, day job, um, it still could be very helpful to learn how to do uh, computer programming. Uh, it can help you become a more intelligent user of computers. It, it can be fun. It's really fun for me. Okay, One of the reasons that I'm teaching this course uh, and that I, I teach in the programs that I do is that I really enjoy these kinds of activities and I'd like to be able to share that joy and interest with uh, you. It's a form of expression. Um, so uh, computer programs have uh, input and output and uh, certainly the output of computer programs can be very expressive. Uh, and so if you enjoy expressing yourself in some kind of a literary or artistic kind of way, this can become the medium for that. Um, it helps the uh, development of problem solving skills, especially in analyzing complex systems by reducing them to interactions between simpler systems. Um, and this is, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot in that claim, okay? Um, the more that we get to know uh, computers and computer programming, uh, we find out that computers are very loyal uh, workers and in that when we tell them to do something, uh, they do it pretty, pretty loyally and pretty reliably. Uh, and they're very fast. Um, but they, um, 
they're not as intuitive as human workers are. Um, and we often have to describe the way of solving the problem in a way that would be, um, I think, uh, kind of boring and maybe wasteful for uh, uh, a human worker. Um, and so we have to break things down into pretty simple parts and parts of parts and parts of parts of parts. Well, um, that turns out how we turn, uh, that's how we solve a complex uh, problem with a computer. But that kind of um, decomposing the problem into parts and parts that are made up of other parts and interrelate with other parts. That's a pretty powerful kind of thinking, not only for programming, but for all kinds of um, business, scientific, research, the, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, of uh, problems that um, uh, whatever profession you choose, having this ability to analyze and break down problems into a series of simpler problems uh, will serve you well. And programmers are in great uh, demand, which is to say uh, it's a job opportunity that you perhaps already have considered or you might want to consider. So what is computer science? Well, computer science, uh, first of all, if you're in my course, you're in an in information science uh, program, you're not in a computer science uh, program. So what is computer science is interesting, but it's not, it's not exactly what we're doing. So um, let's go through the, uh, the material as the author intended. Uh, so computer science is not the study of computers. Um, and uh, uh, Dijkstra, who is a famous uh, computer scientist, he has a quote here, computers are to computer science what telescopes are to astronomy. Okay, uh, the telescope is a tool for astronomy. Uh, and so astronomy is not the study of uh, telescopes. It's the study of astronomical phenomena with uh, telescopes. So uh, computer science you're seeing here is, is the study of uh, problem solving, um, a whole range of problems um, uh, with uh, computers. So the question becomes, what processes can be uh, described? Uh, what kind of problems can you solve with computers? Um, and then the question could really come down to what can be uh, computed. And I, I would say that information scientists are interested in all of these things uh, and a lot of other things too. And again, I think we, we cover that well in our introductory uh, courses. Um, but uh, what we're going to find out soon as we read through the chapter of this book, and hopefully I warned you in the notes when I assigned the reading, is that um, people uh, who go into computer science often have a math uh, background. So the problems that they're interested in, the ones that really kind of hold their interest, are mathematical problems, right? Um, and um, those aren't the only kinds of problems um, that can be solved by uh, computers. Uh, certainly some uh, math is involved. Uh, my promise is uh, I never ask anybody to do uh, math that's any more uh, complex than the high school algebra that I learned uh, when I was uh, a freshman in high school, which I think people now learn in about sixth or seventh grade. Okay, so uh, I'm not really all that interested in complex uh, mathematical uh, questions, although you'll discover that the author is, and I, uh, I, I don't want that to turn you off, uh, okay? We'll sort of entertain some of the mathematical uh, phenomena that he explores with programs, um, but there's plenty to be explored in, uh, certainly in the practice of information and science and in life and in a whole lot of interesting professions and careers uh, that can be done with uh, computer programming and a knowledge of algebra, right? That's about as hard as it gets.
right? If you are a mathematician, you can make it, you can get the math to go a lot harder, okay? But um, uh, don't get fooled into thinking uh, that uh, computing and programming are only for people who are excited by and interested in advanced uh, mathematics. Uh, design, okay? Uh, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, computers are uh, are a bit, um, well, I, I like to say they're dumb, but they're fast, okay? So they only do, uh, they only do uh, a handful of things. You know, they move inf information around, they compare information, one piece of information to another information, they do math, uh, they retrieve things from storage, they store things, uh, they do things like that. And uh, uh, they're very helpful at us because they're, they don't get tired, uh, they don't get bored. Um, and they pretty much can work all day long, all, every day, every year. And so we can, we can come up with uh, designs of solutions that, again, would either wear out or bore or demotivate a human worker. Uh, that's fine for computers, okay? So uh, we often have to think uh, quite a bit about how to organize our solution in order to put it in terms that the computer is going to be able to um, uh, to execute uh, easily and well. So th that uh, design for the problem solving is called a design. Um, the, the process that we design, you know, the method for solving the problem um, is uh, called an algorithm. Um, I'd like to think of algorithm and recipe being uh, pretty similar words. Uh, so an algorithm is to problem solving with uh, computers as a recipe is to uh, uh, cooking to uh, create uh, food and, and uh, delicious uh, meals. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, according to our, our author, an algorithm is a step-by-step -step process for achieving the desired result. Sounds a lot like a recipe to me. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, computer scientists, if you go back to the last slide, they said one of the questions that they're really interested in is, what can be uh, computed, what problems are solvable, and what problems are not, okay? And the fact is that uh, uh, certainly that's of interest to information scientists and uh, everyday uh, practitioners, but uh, typically um, in our day jobs, uh, we solve a series of similar problems, and we don't really get mm, kind of asked to solve uh, problems that are unsolvable. Okay, so um, um, uh, in this uh, computer science uh, sense, if we can write one uh, program, one algorithm that can solve the problem at hand, well then we proved it's uh, solvable. Um, on the other hand, if, we, if we're not able to write it, then we really haven't proved it's unsolvable. And computer science, um, there's a whole field of it that uh, uh, sort of classifies algorithms and problems as to um, how solvable the problem is. And it is interesting, but um, it's not really programming, okay? Uh, generally, um, most of us are asked to do solvable problems. And uh, so we're not too concerned about the unsolvability of, of problems when we go to create a program. Analysis, what's that? Analysis is a process of examining algorithms and problems mathematically. Well, if you're a computer science professor, I think that's probably true. 
I would I would take the word mathematically and I would replace it with logically. Okay, again, uh, we're not going to be using in this course and a lot of this in our kind of everyday computing uh, practice, we're not going to be um, using much more than just algebra. So, but we are going to be using a lot of logic. Um, and um, th to some of us, uh, the logical parts will be new. But they're really fun, and um, I think you'll like those. Some seemingly simple problems are not solvable by any algorithm. These uh, problems are said to be unsolvable. Okay. Again, typically not the problems that people ask us to solve in our day jobs with the computing that we're doing. Um, if they're unsolvable, they're intractable. You can't, you can't uh, manipulate them to solve them. Uh, and how, uh, how are they intractable? Well, they would either take too long or take too much memory to be of practical value. And there even might be uh, problems that uh, could be solved by some uh, combination of uh, computers uh, uh, of a certain uh, computing s speed and a certain amount of memory. But uh, the problem is not a high value problem, and so it would not be, uh, it would not be economically feasible. So we can solve some some uh, computing uh, problems with a lot of computing power and then turn around and go um, but you know we just solved a, a problem that you know solving is it is worth a quarter and we just uh, paid a dollar to uh, solve it so we do have to think about the economics of this and, and the solvability but I'll say that in my uh, professional life um, that's not something that's been on my mind on an everyday basis. Um, experimentation. So some problems are too complex for analysis. Uh, so we implement a system, then we study its uh, behavior. Now, what we're really talking about here is a computer simulation for the most part. So. Um, certain uh, phenomena in the world that people are interested in. Now, who is interested in these things? Uh, scientists, uh, business people, uh, uh, doctors, medical uh, people. They, uh, they want to ask what if about some things that, that are pretty hard to just go out and, and see, right? Maybe they want to know what if about things that just don't happen a lot in the physical world. So you just can't go out and examine them. So one of the things you can do with software is to build a model of that thing in the world uh, and run a lot and observe the behaviors that it has um, as a way to find out uh, about what might happen in the real world. So this the whole approach is called uh, simulation, uh, and it's some pretty powerful uh, stuff. Now, um, here's a diagram of a very simplified uh, computer, and uh, the computers that we use every day, our laptops, our desktops, our smartphones, um, uh, have this uh, kind of overall architecture. Uh, the uh, we have a kind of input uh, uh, devices, ways that the computer uh, gets uh, data from the world, and for our laptop, that's uh, typically uh, things like our mouse and our keyboard. Okay, uh, uh, we can also get input uh, from uh, files that are on our machine. Uh, data uh, files and of course uh, if we're connected to uh, the internet we can download files from the internet so all those kinds of things can be input to computing the um, 
the sort of uh, the computing engine of a computer is a combination of the CPU, the central processing unit, and uh, main memory. You know, what we mean by main uh, memory uh, typically these days uh, is called RAM, random access memory. So for instance, I have a laptop here that uh, has uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM. Okay, and it has a pretty fast uh, CPU. Okay, so uh, in terms of the capability of the laptop that I have, um, it's a pretty beefy CPU and a lot of memory. Okay, but uh, my smartphone has a slower CPU and less uh, uh, main uh, memory. And yet, uh, a lot of the activities I can do equally well on both. There are some that uh, I could only do on my laptop and I could not do on my smartphone. And then we have the output uh, devices. We have things like um, uh, printers and uh, displays, monitors as we call them. Uh, we have uh, um, audio output. So we have uh, sometimes either music or uh, speaking that will uh, come out of the computer. You're probably playing this uh, recording on a computer right now. So we have a lot of different kinds of output uh, devices. And then um, what's called on this uh, diagram uh, secondary memory is uh, some kind of storage okay and uh, as uh, uh, technologies uh, change and the various uh, prices of things uh, change um, we use uh, various kinds of uh, secondary memory um, one that I think that a lot of people are used to is uh, disk storage uh, on what we commonly call a hard drive so most people's uh, laptops have a, a hard drive, um, which is a bunch of uh, magnetic media that spin around, uh, and the computer are, uh, the computer is able to control the hard drive both to, to write uh, data to the hard drive or to read. Um, my uh, my MacBook Pro uh, that I'm recording this on has uh, a has an SSD uh, secondary memory, so it's uh, it has uh, computer chips, uh, solid state uh, devices that uh, uh, kind of act in, in the same way that a hard drive would. Um, these uh, computer chips are non-volatile, uh, so when we turn off the computer, um, you know, say so we close up the laptop, we expect the main memory to lose all the information that's in it. Uh, that's the reason that we typically uh, shut down our computers in some kind of a reasonably orderly way so that everything that we want to save gets uh, saved out to secondary uh, memory. And certainly the CPU goes to uh, sleep and uh, typically will lose whatever information was in it when it lost power. But the secondary uh, memory uh, persists over uh, time. So uh, we have all kinds of technologies for uh, secondary uh, memory, um, uh, hard drives, uh, solid state uh, drives, uh, USB sticks. Those are all what we would call here secondary memory. Um, so the CPU, the central processing unit is really the smartest of all these uh, parts. It does all the work. Um, so it, uh, it does arithmetic operations. Uh, 
it will test if two numbers are equal and it at least initiates the commands to uh, store data um, into the main uh, memory and into uh, a secondary memory and to fetch it from uh, the main uh, memory and secondary memory as well. Um, so the memory stores both the programs and the data. Uh, and this is why the kind of programs, that, uh, the kind of computers that were learned out are called stored program general purpose uh, computers. Okay. Um, it turns out that the program is really just data. It's a special kind of data. Um, it's data that uh, can be used to run a, co a computer uh, program. Uh, as, compar as uh, compared to data that would be maybe input to a computer program or output from a, a computer program. Um, so the memory, uh, both uh, uh, the primary uh, memory and the secondary uh, memory, uh, store some combination of programs and data. So where is your data? Well, when it's inside the computer running actively well it is let's go back uh, it, it is uh, in the main memory for the most part and then uh, uh, for certain uh, short instance uh, inside the CPU before it goes uh, back out to the main memory okay if uh, if the if that particular application is not running, well, then the data and the programs are out in the secondary uh, memory. And it's a little, um, a little surprising. Uh, the programs are just uh, data. They're just a special kind of uh, data. And that the computer uh, c you know, can tell the difference between, say, a Python a program that we're going to learn how to write, and uh, a file that contains one of those, and a file that contains a string of input data, or uh, some kind of a printed report as output data. But that's all part of the scheme of things, and so that uh, when it comes right down to it, uh, programs are, are just uh, a special class of data. Um, so the CPU could only directly access information stored in main memory, okay? Uh, main uh, memory is fast, but volatile. Uh, volatile in the sense that when you turn off the switch, everything gets lost. Uh, when the power is interrupted, the contents of the memory are lost. It's also expensive compared to secondary memory, so that... Uh, uh, you know, why not just put everything into main? Why not just have a giant main uh, memory? Uh, too expensive, okay? In my, per, perhaps not feasible. The, the bigger the main memory gets, uh, the slower the access from the CPU becomes. So there's a, there are a economic and a kind of engineering reasons why we want to have a smaller amount of uh, main uh, memory that is uh, very fast and potentially expensive and uh, volatile and then a bigger amount of uh, uh, secondary uh, memory that is uh, less expensive per uh, you know per uh, per uh, kilobyte or megabyte or gigabyte stored, uh, but slower and um, it's less uh, volatile, okay? Input devices, I talked about uh, keyboards, mice, etc. Output devices, monitor, printer, etc. Fetch execute cycle. Uh, so, um, uh, the, the thinking part of the computer, the CPU, uh, really only executes uh, one instruction at a time. 
and it has to fetch it from the main memory before it executes it. So the first instruction is retrieved from the main uh, memory. Uh, it decodes the instruction to see what it represents. It executes it, uh, the appropriate action is carried out. The next instruction is fetched, decoded, and executed, and then over and over and over again. So this, uh, this uh, the kind of default uh, behavior of computer programs um, is that they work sequentially. So we do one instruction and then the next one and then the next one and the next one. Now we're going to learn that there are uh, there's if then else kind of logic, there's looping logic, there's all that kind of stuff. Um, but the real work, anytime you have to do real work, uh, you probably have a fairly sizable sequence of instructions that have to be done one after the other. So what are programming languages like? Well, the one we're going to learn about is called uh, Python. Uh, so we don't program computers in natural languages like uh, English or Chinese or, uh, uh, or uh, Spanish, OK? Because they're natural languages. And uh, what's kind of interesting is that as unambiguous as you think we can make our natural language when we go to write a paragraph of it, um, uh, typically when you go to write a computer program, you're reading a natural language and, and you're saying, OK, how am I going to turn this into a program? And then you discover there's a lot of ambiguity in it. Well, did it, you know, do we want to go to it? Do we want to stop here or after the next one? Or are we going to process the first one? Or are we going to throw that away? Or you know, do there have to be? Does there have to be at least one? Um, can there be more than ten? Can there be more than a thousand? There are all these kinds of things like when you read an English expression of a problem, it's, it, it, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And when you turn it into a program, you'll see um, it's pretty challenging. All kinds of questions come up because programming languages are more precise, okay? And they're, of course, more easily uh, uh, translated into the machine instructions that the program that uh, the CPU and the computer are able to execute. Um, every structure in a programming language has a precise form called a syntax. OK, so uh, uh, the computer in its uh, processing of the code that we write is going to be pretty unforgiving and the way that we write it. We have to uh, we have to put it just into the right form or the right syntax. Uh, every structure in a programming language has a precise meaning called its semantics. So what do we mean? How exactly do we say it? It's syntax. And what do we really mean? Semantics. Um, a programming language is like a code for writing the instructions the computer will follow. Programmers often refer to their uh, programs as a code. That they might call it computer code, or they might just call it a code. And instead of uh, programming, they might say that they're uh, coding. Now, um, there's a there's a whole discussion of uh, the levels of computer languages that um, is worth having, but not getting too stuck on. It turns out that that uh, CPU that we saw a few slides ago, um, it really reads a kind of a, a computer language called machine code or uh, machine language. 
and um, it's very detailed and it's all uh, on, a, on a binary computer and all of our computers that we're going to be using these days are uh, binary computers. It's just a sequence of zeros and ones, okay? Now, it's coded in such a way that it represents the instructions um, that the CPU is going to follow. But if you remember the list of what uh, CPUs can do, it's pretty limited. Uh, the CPU can do arithmetic. So you can give it uh, two values and you can say to add it or subtract it or divide it. Um, you can uh, you can ask it to compare two values and see if they're equal or one is greater than the other. Um, you can ask it to uh, uh, you, you can ask it to to retrieve uh, some data and bring it into the CPU. You, you can you can ask it to take some data and move it out of the CPU. Uh, you can ask it you can you can ask it for uh, uh, something to be moved from one part of the main uh, memory to another part of the main uh, memory. Now, it, it, this is very boring stuff. I mean, it's not it's not the way the humans like to think of problems. Okay, so instead of writing our programs in this lower level machine language uh, we human programmers don't do that anymore uh, we use high level computer languages um, they're designed to be used by and understood by humans um, and we actually have programs that run that take our high level computer programs and turn them into low level uh, computer language or uh, machine uh, language so the the translation of our uh, high level thinking into the low level operations that uh, computers actually do is done for us by uh, uh, code that we don't have to write things called uh, compilers and interpreters that we'll talk about in a uh, minute. Okay. So uh, here's how boring the kind of things that these uh, CPUs uh, can do uh, uh, as you program them, as you program them in a machine uh, language. Uh, load the number from memory location uh, 2001 load the number from memory location into uh, from uh, 2002 add the numbers in the cpu store the results in location 2003 um, again it, it, these are not uh, uh, things that we write in prose like we see in the bullets of the slide but uh, encode instructions um, that eventually are stored uh, in uh, binary in ones or uh, ones and uh, zeros okay now how do you ever get anything done um, if you as as a computer can only do such really basic stuff well computers are unimaginably fast they never get bored they never get a bad attitude although you'll think that they do from time to time when, when they're not uh cooperating um and, and so this this uh these activities which would be really low level boring activities for humans and this would be a really boring way for a human to solve the problem uh, this is how computers actually solve the problem down at the lowest kind of a level. Okay, and um, it's a good thing that the programming language that we use um, is much more higher level and abstract than that. Because, uh, again, it's I have uh, as a learning exercise exercise I've coded uh, you know machine uh, language uh, programs and um, 
it's really boring. It's really tedious. It's really boring. And there are uh, languages in between, uh, higher level languages like uh, uh, Python and lowest uh, level languages like uh, machine uh, language. And we'll talk about them uh, before. But most of us, those of us who are trying to not, those of us who don't work for computer companies, right, who are not uh, trying to build the computing infrastructure, most of us uh, code in high level languages uh, like Python, which we're going to be using in this course. So what does a high level language look like? Well, that's what the whole course is about. But if we were trying to do the same thing, if we were trying to add two numbers that are stored in the memory and we were trying to get them and we we're trying to add them and then store the result in a third place, well then in uh, Python, our uh, code would look uh, kind of like this. Uh, we would represent the the locations in the memory with uh, variable names. Uh, here we're using very uh, simple ones, uh, A, B, and C. We, we're going to learn that uh, variable names are good when they're more uh, descriptive than that, but this is all we know about the problem. Um, and so we would say um, that we want to we want to uh, take the value in A and add it to the value in B and store the result in C. Okay, that's what this uh, would mean. Um, so this has to be translated into machine language that the computer can execute. Um, and exactly how that's done. Um, is a lot of what uh, people do at uh, computer companies, right? So, I mean, we can describe it here kind of, uh, kind of simply. Is that done as a one-step uh, process? Well, uh, sometimes. Is that done as, as a two-step or a three-step process? Well, uh, probably more often than one. Uh, it, do, it, do we do that translation for the whole program before we start to execute any of it? Uh, well, uh, sometimes. Uh, do, we, uh, do we do that uh, translation for just a bit and execute that? Well, some approaches uh, work like that uh, too. Um, so uh, compilers which are a, a sort of a popular conversion uh, tool. They convert a written a high level language uh, program into, uh, into the machine language of some uh, computer. And this is the first time we said the machine language of some uh, computer. Uh, you probably know that the processor, the computer that's in your laptop is not the same um, you know, the CPU and the memory and all that stuff, the actual uh, physical uh, computing uh, device. It's not the same one that's in your laptop, that's in your telephone, that's in your watch, right? That's in your uh, DVR. They're all different. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, depending upon your point of view, the machine languages are different uh, in all of them. Now, are, are they grossly different? Um, well, there are a couple of, uh, a couple of families of uh, machine uh, languages. There's a couple of styles of them. Um, and some, some have some benefits than, uh, uh, and others have, have others. But uh, one of the problems is that uh, machine language uh, programs are not very portable. Okay, so I could write a machine language program um, that will run on, on my MacBook Pro, uh, but it would not run on my, uh, it would not run on my iPhone. Okay, now high level languages uh, get us away from that problem. Okay, because high level languages are are processed by uh, compilers, and as we're going to see in a minute, by these things called interpreters. 
Um, and uh, uh, the compilers and the interpreters, they turn that high level code into the machine language of uh, the machine at hand. So high level language programs are more portable than low level language uh, programs. Um, and they're more, uh, more easily understood by humans. They just uh, typically are not executed uh, directly. Uh, okay, so we're going to do our programming. And uh, you're going to see us do it. We're going to do our programming in Python. And then we're going to click a button. And we're going to wait for that uh, program to be translated uh, in some fashion into machine uh, language. And then we're going to see it execute. And now, one of the nice things is that happens very, very fast for the, the size of programs that we're going to be running. It, it's going to appear instantaneous. OK? But that makes our code portable. In theory, the, the, the Python that we're going to write uh, could run on my MacBook Pro. Um, it could run on your Dell Windows 10 laptop. Um, it could run on um, it could run on my iPhone. Um, it could run on your Samsung phone. Okay, um, you just have to have the patience and, and the tools uh, to do the interpreting or compiling to, to translate it into the machine language that that computer actually uses. Okay, so uh, here's the uh, here's the classic um, way that this uh, works. Um, you write a, a high uh, you write a source code program in a high level language. Now we're going to learn uh, Python, but we could have learned uh, Java, or we could have learned one of the older languages like uh, COBOL or PL1 or uh, BASIC or C. Okay. Um, and it goes through a compiler, and a compiler is a computer program. Um, well, who wrote that computer program? Well, probably somebody at the computer uh, manufacturer or at the operating system uh, company. So it's, it's uh, um, uh, typically they come with the computer or with the operating system. Okay. And what comes out of that is machine code. Okay, if you do this in the classic way, which of course it turns out that we don't actually do um, in Python. If we do this in the classic way, this is how it was done in the in the C and the COBOL and the um, in the PL1 days. You'd run it through the compiler, and the compiler might have several steps in it. I'm not saying that you can do it in just one shot. But then you turn it into, into machine code. Um, and then when you run your program, what would be run would be a file. It would be out in secondary storage. It would be out on your hard drive, or it would be out on your SSD drive. Uh, and when you say to run the program, it loads that file into main, um, main uh, memory. And it, it tells the CPU, uh, run that program. And you get the running program. And what do running programs do? Well, they read inputs and they write outputs. OK. Now, uh, do we have to compile an entire program all the way from the beginning to the end in order to uh, begin to run uh, parts of it? Well, it turns out we don't. There's another approach that is called interpreting. So uh, there's a, another kind of a program, an alternative to a compiler, called an interpreter. And it simulates a computer that understands a high-level language. Now, there probably were interpreters that did this, but I'm going to show you some graphics in a little bit in a, in to say that uh, most interpreters uh, most interpreters these days interpret a mid-level language uh, called bytecode language. But 
and that's not something we discuss in the chapter, but I'll discuss it in a, in just a minute. Uh, so the source uh, program is not translated into machine language all at once. So uh, the idea of an interpreter is that we would get uh, an, uh, an instruction or two or three from the higher level language uh, and we would uh, turn them into executable code uh, and then we would be ready to execute them uh, just the fragment of the program okay and you'll see when we start to work with Python is that Python is an interpreted style language and uh, you can actually uh, type in just one line of code like that one that we saw before uh, uh, C equals a plus B um, and we could uh, we could type that in and then we could go see what the answers uh, were immediately we wouldn't have even if it was a 30 line program we could we could tell the computer well uh, just execute this first one and then we could see what the answer was okay for some programmers that helps that it, it creates a style of running and testing your uh, computing that is not available in uh, compiled style uh, languages. Um, so an interpreter as compared to a, a compiler, which a compiler it translates the entire program, high level program all at once into machine code. An interpreter analyzes and executes the source code instruction by instruction. Okay, so uh, what they would have you believe here uh, is it works uh, like this. Uh, we have a computer running an interpreter. So we fire up the, the interpreter, in our case, the Python interpreter. And then we point it to our source code program, a Python file. And that starts to run. And so our high level program uh, is really data to the interpreter and it reads a bit and then it goes and executes that bit and it reads a bit more and it executes that a bit more and while it's doing that um, it turns uh, it reads the inputs and it writes uh, uh, the outputs one of the things that I think is really elegant about these stored program general purpose computers is that they kind of eat their own dog food in the sense that you we just kind of build the capability up and up and up okay but what the what the computer can really do at the lowest kind of a level is that kind of activity that we talked about with uh, loading a value in from one storage location, loading another from another, adding them, storing them back to a third, that kind of stuff. But what we can do is by layering programs on top of each other, uh, we can uh, create a situation here uh, where it appears that our uh, source code uh, program is being interpreted and executed a line at a time um, uh, from, in our case, uh, Python to, uh, to the machine uh, language of whatever uh, machine we're on. And again, that could be my MacBook Pro, that could be your Dell laptop with uh, Windows 10, it could be either of our uh, smartphones. It could be the iOS one, it could be the Android one. Uh, so why do we compile, why would we compile versus interpreting? Once a program is compiled, it can be executed over and over without the source code or the compiler. If it's interpreted, the source code and the interpreter are needed each time the program runs. Compiled programs generally run faster since the translation of the source code happens only once. Okay, 
now so you kind of go well gee wouldn't want we wouldn't we always want to compile versus interpret well interpreting uh again you're going to see that the the interpreting environment of the python programming environment gives us an opportunity to kind of see behavior as we go as a programmer well you don't get that from compiled environments so that's an advantage that you get from interpreters and the other thing you get is portability okay uh, if we go back okay you just have to get the interpreter that runs on this uh, computer okay so uh, uh, so we would say I would write my uh, Python program and when I want to run it on my map on my MacBook Pro I'd run the interpreter for the MacBook Pro when I want to run it on my iPhone I would uh, get the interpreter for the iPhone it's a different computer program a different gr a group of people at Apple wrote the program if I wanted to run it on my uh, on my Dell with Windows 10 then I would use the interpreter uh, written by people probably at Microsoft okay if I wanted to run it on my Android smartphone I would probably use the Python interpreter uh, written by the people at uh, Google okay so one of the good things about interpreting um, is that even though it's slower it's much more portable okay so um, our chapter doesn't talk about this but people have come up with a, a happy medium okay and what really happens with Python and with all modern programming languages like uh, oh Python uh, Java um, well again most uh, modern programming languages work in the following way uh, I'm going to pull in an illustration and then I'll show you where the illustration came from okay what they do is that they create okay a an intermediate kind of code it's not machine code okay and it's not source code so uh, here we have a program it's called M my program what's to say okay uh, and uh, what happens is that uh, before it's interpreted it is uh, translated into an intermediate kind of a code called byte code okay so uh, as we get working with our tools you're going to see that uh, Python um, if we have a, a program called M okay then uh, uh, the file that we put our Python co code in is going to be called m.py uh, when it gets turned into bytecode which happens kind of invisibly to us it creates this m.pyc what's a pyc file well it's python bytecode and then um, what is interesting is, is that both the source code and the bytecode are portable okay and so now all you need to do is is to write this thing called a python virtual machine that's pvm uh, to run the bytecode okay so what really happens uh, to our uh, Python uh, is it's it's uh, it, it's compiled in little bits uh, into uh, into bytecode and, and then that bytecode gets executed by the Python virtual uh, machine now that's really above the level of understanding that's in uh, chapter one of the Zell book and if you were interested in uh, a discussion because you're less of a beginner 
you might go um, you might uh, Google uh, something like that but uh, here's a good article on uh, I guess this is a blog uh, it's called Oznet Nerd uh, and uh, the article is about interpreted bytecode and just in, in time and that is a higher level discussion of it than I just did okay so what's good about this kind of solution is it um, is it uh, closes the performance gap between uh, compiled solutions and interpreted so solutions because um, the speed uh, difference of uh, of running uh, an interpreter that interprets uh, bytecode and um, uh, just running the machine code that comes out of a, a compiler uh, it's certainly slower but the difference is not what it wants uh, was so there was a time when people thought that interpreted uh, languages like uh, Python were uh, slow and uh, um, compiled languages like C were fast and the fact that this whole uh, bytecode uh, scheme has significantly narrowed that gap um, and uh, what's happening is that you're seeing uh, people going for languages like Python and Java has a similar approach but it doesn't have hmm, Java claims to be a compiled language, so it compiles everything into bytecode all at one time, whereas um, a Python, uh, you can get it to compile just uh, just one line at a time into bytecode, and then you, you're able to execute that. So the languages really do have different styles when you're programming in them, um, but uh, the performance of languages like uh, Python and uh, Java, because I use this uh, bytecode approach, and you only have to write the runtime for each of the machines that you want to you want to run it on. Um, it's really closed the gap. They don't. It doesn't run as fast as uh, compiling all the way to machine code, but it's more portable. And um, this uh, style of, um, um, you know, this uh, kind of solution family is, is the solution family of the day. Uh, so that's why Python is so popular right now, even though it's an interpreted language. Um, by the time you really get down to executing it, it's interpreting something that you can interpret pretty darn fast. Okay, that's that. All right, so let's see where else we're going here. Uh, compiling versus interpreted, I talked about that. Okay, so uh, the chapter doesn't talk about the uh, bytecode and, and uh, that, but that's the reason why uh, these uh, languages that are using bytecode and uh, Python in particular um, are as popular as they are in a world where we're trying to solve uh, big data problems. Okay? Um, you can still get it to run pretty darn fast. Uh, what we see here on slide number 28 is what you would see if you started up the Python interpreter okay it gives you a prompt and you can type into it and it can respond so there's a lot of stuff in the textbook that has you uh, kind of learning how to write python a line at a time so again you can write a line of python and then you can you can actually get it to execute uh, immediately and that's kind of nice when you're a learner more typically though what we're going to learn to be doing is we're going to learn to write a series of lines of python okay we're going to maybe we're not going to try to get the whole program done just right but we're going to write a part and then we're going to say okay let's run that to 
uh, to test it. So even though this is a good learning feature um, that you're going to see here, um, in terms of your day job in writing uh, useful programs for to, to solve uh, problems that you have to do, this line at a time stuff is more kind of a learner's uh, crutch than it is a uh, practitioner's normal mode of uh, behavior. But it's fun to do, and we definitely are going to do it. OK? Uh, so these, the triple uh, greater sign is a Python prompt. So it's ready to give uh, commands. And so here we're just, we haven't taught you all these commands, but now we're starting to do them. So uh, there's, there's a command called, there's a procedure called print. So if you say print and you pass it these, uh, this string, hello world, as an argument, then um, as soon as you hit enter, it says, OK, I know how to do that. It just says, hello world. So uh, that's the output. Or you can say print 2 plus 3, and it'll go, I know how to do that, 5. Uh, or you can print the character string 2 plus 3 equals, and then the expression 2 plus 3. So then you can get uh, kind of the documentation of the problem that you're solving. Uh, 2 plus 3 equals, that's just a label uh, for the result that comes out uh, 5. OK? So a lot of our early learning will be like this, right? Um, uh, it's uh, kind of nice to not to have to put together an entire program uh, before you can start to see results from the language. All right. Uh, here we go. Usually we want to execute several statements together that solve a common problem. And, and there is, there's a structure for that, and it's this thing called a function, okay? So we can give a group of statements a name, uh, like hello, okay? Um, so we can say, I want to define a function called hello. These parentheses are eventually going to hold these things uh, called arguments or parameters and uh, wait for that. Uh, we'll show you how they work in just a uh, minute. The colon says, okay, uh, the code that comes after is the code that makes up the function. And uh, uh, indented, we've got print hello and print computers are fun. Okay, so we enter all that and what do we get? We get nothing. Why? Well, because uh, this is like the kid's game of uh, Simon Says, okay? When you type an instruction in a naked instructor that's not inside a function, well, Simon Says to do that, okay? Well, what happens when you type in a function? Well, um, uh, Simon's actually saying, remember this. Remember that the function hello uh, has the parts print hello, print computers are fun. So you really haven't told the machine to do it yet. You have to come back and say, run hello, do the hello. Then you'll get that to happen. OK. Um, so uh, we don't get the results uh, yet. OK, so then how can we get the results? Well, if you look down here on 32, uh, slide number 32, we have a, um, uh, we have a function call, or uh, what we call an invocation. OK, so we say that we invoke a function. It's invoked, or we call it. It's called. So we say, hello, OK? And the, the Python environment goes, oh, hello, that's the name of a function. Uh, Kevin wants to run it. So it runs the first uh, print, hello. It runs the second, computers are fun. 
Okay. And why did it finally do it? Well, because Simon said hello. Okay. That's, that's the difference. So code that's out on its own, not inside of a function, well, when that gets encountered, it gets immediately executed. Uh, code that's inside of a function, it just gets remembered until we get uh, the code that says run that function. Okay. Come on. Uh, what's the deal with those parentheses? Well, it's a really powerful idea. Um, uh, the, the values that go in the uh, parentheses are sometimes called parameters or sometimes called arguments. In some languages, they differentiate between those uh, names, but here they're used pretty inter interchangeably. So what we can do is uh, we can define a function and we can put we can put the name of a variable here okay we can say uh, greet person and then we say hello person we actually print out whatever name that we begin how are you well how does that work well so then we can call greet we can say greet and then we pass the argument the string uh, Terry and now it says hello Terry how are you and then we can say greet Paula and it says hello Paula how are you okay so when we use uh, parameters we can customize the output of our function and this is um, again all this code that we're seeing here um, you know the print uh, functions uh, parameters we'll have whole chapters on this Okay, so uh, try to keep up, but don't get too, uh, uh, if it seems like the ideas are coming fast and furious, well, they are, because we want to give you something uh, quickly that, uh, you know, it'll do some real work, uh, okay? Uh, do you understand it down to the nitty gritty? Well, if you're new to Python, probably not, but um, uh, trust us. Trust us, we'll explain it in more detail later. Okay? So this kind of approach where we we create a function, like we did here. Um, so we began with one that, that just said hello in a pretty impersonal way. And now we've turned it into a more general function that can say hello to a bunch of different uh, people. Uh, so this this ability to pass arguments to functions makes them more general it makes them more powerful okay it allows us to get more work done with less uh, code so this is something that we're going to be uh, depending upon quite a lot although the use we've made for it so far is pretty mundane um so when we exit the Python prompt, when we when we're operating inside of this interpreted Python uh, environment, that that's all we've seen so far in the text. Uh, it's it's only holding on to the program and the data so long as we're still running the Python interpreter. So when we exit it. Okay, when we say we want to quit the Python interpreter, everything goes away. Why? Well, it's really only stored in the main memory of the computer, and it's volatile. Okay? We never said that we wanted to save it into secondary uh, memory. We never saved it, a copy of our program out onto the hard drive. Now, there are times... Uh, you know, you've had jobs, uh, you're trying to solve some kind of problem once. So uh, you have to add up a bunch of numbers or you have to do some calculations, so you get a calculator. Or you might even get a spreadsheet program and you may 
type everything in and get the answers. And you might not save, you know, the calculator is not going to save uh, your code. You might not save your spreadsheet, so that's it. Yeah, you could do that with Python. You you could you can open up uh, Python and use it the same way and not save the program. It's not the typical use case though. Typically when we're programming, we're not looking for a one-off answer. We're looking to create some kind of tool that we can use again and again. Okay? There are things where we're looking for a one-off answer, but um that's not the typical use case. Uh, so, how do we save that code in some kind of program? So, programs are usually composed, composed of functions uh, or modules and scripts so that when we save this code in a file, we could call it a module or a script. And we save them onto disk so that they can be used again and again. A module file is a text file created in text editing software saved as plain text that contains a uh, function uh, definitions. Now, in my class, instead of using the Python interpreter directly, and instead of using a, um, a text editor, a plain old text editor to write the code and save it into, into module files, we use a, um, a Python integrated uh, development environment called PyCharm. Why? Well, because it's very convenient. Okay, it gives us the, it has a text editor, it has an interpreter to run the code, it has all kinds of features and it's all in one product for us to use. So we're gonna be learning how to do that, not in the lectures, but other places. Um, and uh, but of course when we are doing uh, text editing of our Python file what part of the tool are we using that PyCharm tool while well, we're using a text editor uh, a programming environment is designed to help programmers write program and usually includes automatic indenting highlighting etc so a good editor for a programming language helps you um, helps you understand the code okay so we're going to be learning how to do that as we go on so uh, now we come to the to the big uh, sample program for the chapter and I've got to say that I wouldn't have chosen this one and why wouldn't I well because I'm not a mathematician uh, okay uh, what our author is going to show us is a program that can do some interesting stuff, which I am interested in, uh, and, uh, and also he's interested in a mathematical phenomenon called uh, chaotic number series. Okay, so uh, it turns out that there are some uh, phenomena out in the real world. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, how they happen, they happen uh, chaotically, okay? Um, and uh, uh, they have certain properties like uh, small changes in inputs can have large uh, changes in outputs. So what's the classic metaphorical expression to that? Well, you know, a, 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 a butterfly uh, uh, flaps its wings in Montana, and there's a uh, there's a hurricane uh, in the Pacific, and it uh, it, uh, it perhaps it, it creates a lot of uh, damage in Hawaii. Okay, how are those things interconnected? Well, by a long chain of things, right? So a small change uh, somewhere, a small change in the input can have a very catastrophic and big change in output. Well, if you're studying those kind of phenomena, okay, and there are a lot of sciences that do, 
weather, uh, some economic things, all that kind of stuff. Well, knowing that you can write some code that will simulate this stuff, well, it would allow you to study those kinds of uh, phenomena without having to physically go out there. And you can maybe have some theories about how we're going to deal with these uh, chaotic phenomena. Well, your average programmer is not writing code um, to analyze or to simulate uh, chaotic phenomena. So, um, whereas a mathematician, which uh, Zell is underneath all his computer science uh, clothing, is very excited about how easy it is to generate this number series, a uh, person like me, who's more of a background in uh, business and information organization and information retrieval, um, this just seems like way too much math. Okay, so um, uh, to you, if if this is really interesting, it's just like, oh, wow, a chaotic function. I always wondered how they did those. Well, dive right in. Okay. And if you're saying, uh, oh my God, I, I, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I thought Kevin said I only had to know algebra. Uh, then uh, don't worry. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to understanding or uh, talking about chaotic phenomena. And the examples that we're going to do for homework are going to be uh, more mundane. Okay, but what's interesting here is this is the first time we see a whole program, I think, and it has an interesting uh, kind of organization. First of all, these first uh, two lines up here are what we call comments. So in a Python program, uh, as soon as the interpreter sees a pound sign on the line, everything after that on that line is a comment. It's a single line comment. So we have one that says that the file is chaos.py. And then we have one that it kind of describes the intent of the program, a simple program illustrating chaotic behavior. So you're going to see that we're going to follow this uh, approach um, uh, for quite a while within the course, okay? Now, what's kind of interesting is, is that why would you have to say what the file name is inside the file? Couldn't you just look on the outside? Well, this is a, a sort of a textbook uh, practice because of course, when you print this, you're, you're really not looking at the file. You're looking at uh, the contents of, of the file printed on the page. And so this uh, convention is one that we're going to follow for quite a while in this course, but eventually uh, you might in your day job not, not, uh, not follow. Because uh, again, if you want to know what the file name is, look at the name of the file. Okay. Now, the next thing that we've done is we've collected up all of our work into a, a function called main. And this is a typical uh, practice. A lot of coding uh, practices help us organize our code in a predictable way such that uh, when we give it to other coders to maintain, you know, we're going to go on to some other job and they're going to maintain this, well, they know where to look for things. And for me, when I come back to something, yeah, a half a year or a year, it, it doesn't really, I don't really remember the act of writing that code. So it's very important to follow good programming conventions about the design and organization of your programming because you could be the person who has to maintain your program. Okay? So there's only one statement that is, as I call, in the clear, not inside of a function. And it's an invocation. It's a method call to uh, the function main. And here's main. 
okay now why is this here well this is a typical thing that the top level code for a Python program is put into a function called main okay and if this is going to be an executable file which it is supposed to be then it's going to at the bottom it's going to have a call to me okay wouldn't wouldn't it be nicer to put the call to main up ahead of the definition for main well as we'll see in one of my tutorials uh, you can't uh, do that you can't refer to things in Python before you've uh, defined them okay uh, so you can't call main before you define a main okay so this is going to be a typical uh, setup okay um, and then there's a couple of other things to, to be learned here some new instructions uh, the comments were new right the 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 use of main and the call to main were new that those are kind of practices the print that's not new we've seen that now this this uh, statement that we we have is called x equal we call these assignment statements so we're saying that some computing should be done on the right side of the expression okay and some value should be had and then we should assign it to the left side okay okay um, so this is an algebraic equivalence we're saying execute the code on the right side come up with a value and plunk it into the variable on the left side x okay now what's interesting is that we we have a function one of the built-in ones called input and we say input and then we give a string so enter a number between 0 and 1 okay and what happens is that when we run this on the console you know on the screen in front of us it's going to print out enter a number between 0 and 1 and then we're going to have to type in a number be between 0 and 1 and press enter okay now what's going to happen then well this eval is an old style way to take the characters that come in from your keyboard and turn them into a number okay so we it's we say we want a number between 0 and 1 and we put in 3 it evaluates the characters that come in and it says it's a three um, I'm going to turn that into a three and one of the things we're going to learn is that there's a difference between the character three and the number three okay and uh, we're going to have to have some explicit conversion or we're going to have to ask uh, to convert the characters into a proper number and then we have this uh, four and this is a classic loop you probably heard of a programming loop uh, this is a for loop and uh, it happens uh, ten times so we go around here uh, ten times so we we uh, calculate X we print X we calculate X we print X we calculate X we print X so we print X ten times and because we're using x in its is part of the the old x is part of the formula for the new x it changes itself as it goes through so let's see let's try to find some code where we run it so uh, so we run this and the first thing it says we have the descriptive this uh, program blah 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 enter uh, uh, a number between 0 and 1 0.5 is between 0 and 1 and then each time it goes through the loop it prints um, a, a value for x uh, 0 1 2 3 4 no I'm sorry 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 there are 10 of them now is that uh, chaotic 
Uh, from my house, I don't know whether that's chaotic or not. Okay. From Zell's house, of course it's chaotic. Okay. So if you're from the Zell camp, be amazed. If you're from the Kevin camp, eh, don't be so impressed. Uh, I'd be happier if we did some simpler math that I could relate to uh, more easily. Okay. Um, okay. Now we start to pick it apart. So the lines that start with the pound sign are called comments. They're just they're for the readers of the program. Okay. Now. Um, you can actually put a comment after some executable code. So um, you can have single line comments where the whole line is a comment, or else you can have a line of code and, and, and have the end of it be a comment about that line of code. Uh, we'll see that before we're done with the, with the text. What do we want? So the code, whatever's inside of the comment, whatever comes after that pound sign, uh, even if it's legal Python code, it's just going to be interpreted as a, a uh, side comment about what's going on. Here's the name of the file. Uh, here's the intention of the program. Okay. Now, we're going to learn over time that, that there, there's, there's a style to commenting. There are good comments and bad. Uh, okay. Uh, these two up front are uh, pretty good. The first one, we're eventually going to decide we're not going to use by the end of, of the course, but we're going to be using it for quite a while because we're going to say, well, you know what? If we want to know what the name of this file is, we'll just go look on the outside of it. Okay. So I, I typically eventually get rid of, of that, but I do want you to do that. And this one is good here because it's intentional, okay? It doesn't tell you, it's not a replay, it's not a rehashing. It's not a play-by-play, -play. well, this code's going to do this and this and this and that. No, it, it says what it's really setting out to accomplish. So uh, typically, we want our comments to be statements of our intention or some notes about some really uh, tricky approach that we took that might not that everybody might not recognize but apart from that um we don't need the co we don't need the comments to be kind of a play by play uh, about what's going in on, on the program we're expecting the people who read the program to be able to see what's going on just because they can read python Okay, but they can't read our intentions. Okay, um, and maybe they can't read what's going on if we've done something particularly tricky. Okay, and, and those are the places where we would like to use uh, comments. So let's go on. Uh, so uh, the definition for main, that's how we declare that we, we have a function called main. Uh, and they go on to talk about how this is a common practice and a, a good one. And it's one that we're going to be following in our course. Um, the, uh, the, the print causes a line that introduces the program. I, I think it's the same as that intentional comment. Uh, there are times when you would want to begin that idea. in the early programming that we're going to do we're going to be doing exactly this later on we're going to start to concentrate on the user experience and maybe the user experience is only so good when you start out by saying this is this program illustrates a chaotic uh, function uh, uh, Maybe it would be better to say something like, you're running the chaos program. Please enter a blah, 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 blah. So uh, this uh, initial uh, print that uh, is kind of a replay of the comment that is a statement of the intention, uh, again, that's going to be a kind of a starter way that, that we do this. Later on, I think we're going to do something just a little bit more user-friendly. 
Um, this eval line is kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to get a number here and we're trying to enter a number between 0 and 1 and of course every time something is uh, every time something comes from an input device uh, typically uh, a keyboard or uh, something like that uh, when they type uh, the character 1 uh, it's a character and it has a different uh, representation inside the computer than the number one has and so uh, this input and then the string causes it to prompt for the input and then to take it and this eval is what turns the string whatever you put in into the number it turns out that eval is uh, not a secure way to do it so we're going to learn some some alternatives for eval pretty quickly, okay? Uh, now I just want to point out uh, something here. In this text, um, the author nearly every time puts a character strings into uh, double quotes instead of apostrophes, and you may find that. Uh, you'll see other textbooks or other bodies of programs in which uh, people prefer to use the apostrophes. And we're going to learn that they're fairly interchangeable. Okay, and so um, uh, I'm going to leave you free to use one or the other. When I began as a more regular Python programmer, I uh, followed the, the double quote thing. Um, in uh, the years since I began as a Python programmer, I've been converted to using apostrophes. Why? Well, because I inherited a lot of code that used apostrophes. And I'm, I'm working in a, a whole framework uh, in which, uh, called uh, Django, in which most of the authors uh, put their character strings into apostrophes. So um, you get to decide, and uh, that's fine. Uh, now this loop uh, construct uh, for I in range uh, 10 we're going to do uh, we're going to do an entire chapter on loops okay so uh, what's what's I it's a variable uh, what's a range well a range is a uh, uh, is a series of numbers okay uh, so what's range 10? Well, um, you would think it, it would be uh, the series 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, you'd be wrong because it turns out to be the series 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And why is that? Well, because in these more modern programming languages like uh, C and Java, and uh, Python, most counting starts from zero. Okay, now um, if it and when you talk to the proponents of the languages, they say, "Well, that's only natural," and they'll give you a lot of examples why that's a really favorable thing to do. Um, for a person like me who began on older languages, where most of the counting started at one, well, it's a pain in the rump. Okay, uh, so what happens is uh, this just goes around uh, 10 times. Well, is there some kind of problem created by the fact that it's not going from 1 to 10, but from 0 to 9? Well, no, not really, because if you look at the code, let's see if we can look at the code here. Um, the code that's in the body of the loop, as we call it, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so this is the body. This is called the body of the loop. This code right here. Uh, okay, it's what's inside the loop. The code that's in the body of the loop never uses the variable i. So why did we create the variable i? Well, 
it's just uh, a control uh, variable for the loop and we get a counter and the loop executes exactly 10 times. So if all we want to do is to do it uh, 10 times and we don't really use i in the calculation, then the fact that it counts from 0 to 9 instead of the the more mundane 1 to 10, it's not really a problem for us. Later on, when we get to loops and we're using them uh, to solve uh, problems where we're using the control uh, variable in the body of the loop, well then it's going to be very important that we remember that it's counting from 0 to 9 instead of from 1 to 10. But here it doesn't have any side effect at all. Now um, the other thing to see here is so what uh, this uh, slide actually says is the following. Um, you this loop that says to do this uh, 10 times this is the same as just having cut and pay, uh, copy pasted the same code uh, 10 times. Now why would we want the loop instead of the 10 times? Well you know what I think these uh, 10 uh, copies are all the same, but it, it take a lot of visual examination to make sure that they are the same. I could easily have a typo in it and not really know it. Um, so the, the loop version only has one expression of the code. That makes it easier to make sure that we don't have a mistake in it. And also, if we come back and we decide that we want to uh, change the formula, well, then we only need to change it in one place. So uh, a, a theme that's going to follow us throughout the course is this idea that we want to get rid of duplicate code. That uh, duplicate code has the problem that it's longer, it's more, it's more to type, but also um, it's more to test, it's more to maintain. So um, even though the code on the right is equivalent to the code on the left, we're going to decide that it's more favorable to use the code on the left because it's more maintainable and more easily tested. Okay? And it's kind of prettier to me. What happens is, is, is that over time these long drawn out repetitions of things start to look ugly to you and these more uh, terse, loopy kinds of expressions of the same things, they look prettier. Now, I've been doing this for 40 years, so uh, I can't say that the first time I looked at it, it looked uh, prettier to me. But it's been looking prettier for certainly 35 years. Okay, so hopefully it'll start to look uh, prettier to you uh, pretty soon. Uh, again, I mentioned before that this statement is what we call an assignment statement. And it's a combination of we have an expression on the right side that has to be evaluated. Okay, and typically there's one value that comes out of it. In this case, it's a number. Okay, and then that has to be assigned over to the other side, and so the answer is going to go into X. Um, what is uh, kind of interesting here is that the variable X is uh, both on the right side and on the left side. So what happens is on the right side, we start with the current uh, value of X, and then we recompute it, and then we we get the new value okay so if we go back up a slide let's see if we can go back up a slide if we go back up a slide so uh, uh, the first time we go through the loop what's what's the starting value of X well it's whatever we typed in I think in the example we typed in 0.5 Okay, well then we calculate it and then we put it in here uh, in here, and we print it. Now we come around 
Now, what, what's the value of x when we come around the second time? Well, it's the one we just uh, printed. Okay, so this is going to change as we go around the loop. Okay. Um, okay, that's it for that. Um, this expression on the right hand side, we call this right hand side, <laughs> RHS, okay? Uh, we call this left hand side, LHS, okay? And even though we use the symbol equal, we're not really saying in some algebraic sense that they're equal. This is our kind of shorthand for saying uh, compute this expression such that you come up with a single value and then move the answer to x. Okay? We're really not saying that they're equal. In fact, in the beginning, they're not. Okay? So, uh, that's why we don't call it an equality statement. We call it an assignment statement. Compute the value and assign it to x. Uh, in terms of the arithmetic, uh, 1 minus x is uh, you subtract the value x from 1. Uh, the, the asterisks are multiplication. Okay. Now, um, there's the whole issue of what order you do these things in, okay? And we're going to learn about that. But, uh, uh, so multiplication is s stronger than, uh, than um, addition and subtraction. So without the parentheses, we do the multiplication before we did the, the subtraction. With the parentheses, uh, it's unambiguous. And we'll talk about that in more detail in another chapter. Uh, the last thing it says, uh, the last thing in the program is main. It says to run the main code. Um, uh, that is the only statement that's the only statement that's out on its own that's not in a function. So that's the only thing that gets run. And again, why is it at the bottom and not at the top? Well, because we're not allowed to refer forward. So at the very top, we could say, I want to execute main, uh, but it doesn't know main yet. That'll give us an error. So the convention is to put it at the bottom. Um, uh, so uh, here's a discussion of uh, the math, o okay? This, this algorithm, this mathematical recipe will give us a series of numbers that appear to be uh, chaotic. Uh, very important to John Sell, uh, not important to Kevin Trainer. Um, and now he's kind of explaining why this is true. Uh, he's truly excited by this. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not. Okay, I, I probably would be a better person if I was, but I'm not. Okay, if, it, if something in my day job, something where I earned my money, or I helped humanity, uh, required me to understand these uh, chaotic uh, series, I would perk right up. But in their own right, they're boring to me. Okay, so he needs new inputs and this and how they're different. If you like this stuff, God bless you. Okay, so this is the end, right? Uh, we're going to do some exercises for our uh, coding assignment, um, and they'll be uh, kind of like things we did in the chapter. I'm going to try to uh, keep the math down to a reasonable level. Um, and uh, again, uh, a lot of these parts that we learned about, we're going to learn more about, you know, like functions. We're going to have a whole chapter on functions. 
uh, loops. We're going to have a whole chapter on loops. Oh, okay, but we've learned just enough to get going, and that ought to be fun. So uh, I'm just going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.